Hello, hello, I am Chris Killian, and we are still here at New York Comic Con, courtesy of Whatnot, and I am here with the legend himself, Kevin Eastman. This is such an honor for me as a, as a giant Turtles fan. Thank you so much for being here. Absolute pleasure being here. Thanks Are for having me Are you enjoying too. New York Comic Con so far? It is quite busy out there. It is very, very busy. It's uh, um, enjoying it very much. It's, it's coming here to me is like, it's, it's like home turf, you know, not only uh, um, um, home of the turtles, which is funny. I was telling somebody just a few minutes ago that issues one, two, and then finally by issue three was my first trip to New York. So I was drawing characters, doing martial arts, which I didn't know martial arts, so living in a city I'd never been to. <laughs> <laughs> New York City. So I'm aping, you know, Jack Kirby and Frank Miller v versions of uh, New York before I had come here. But this still feels um, very much home turf, home of the turtles. I'm an East Coast guy anywhere. And then to uh, come out of COVID and be back here with yeah, yeah. all our fans is fantastic. Well, I want to start off with a little warm up question. Uh, which turtle head is your favorite to draw? <laughs> the uh, um, It's so funny because uh, I always feel bad because somebody will say, I would do like a little remark um, on when I sign an autograph, I'd draw a little turtle head. And they go, which one is that? And I go, which one's your favorite? Because unless you're coloring in the bandana yeah, yeah, yeah. or anything. So, um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much they all, they all look alike. Yeah, you, you've, signed, uh, you've signed a signature for me uh, before and, and, and sent me the comic book and, uh, and I just went ahead and colored it in blue. I'm just kidding, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> color should. it. I, didn't I would say yeah. <laughs> no, um, but, as, you know, but you two try to, um, you know, uh, give one like a little smirk or a grimace if it's Raphael or something like that. So it's a, uh, uh, but you ever see that thing where they were drawing Ninja Turtles on people's noses? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that see was that. so crazy, right? That was and somebody wild. figured that, you know, a lot of free time to figure out. You can <laughs> draw the shape of your nose with a turtle mask. Maybe. Yeah, you gotta wonder where that even came from. Uh, you know, obviously there's been so many iterations of the turtles over the years. I have to ask, what's your absolute favorite movie with the turtles? That first one, yeah. Without, hands down. Me you too. Know, that, it was, not only because it was the first one, which was amazing, but it was, um, in so many ways, it really was a perfect storm in that um, we were lucky enough to, to have uh, Steve Barron uh, come on board as a director. And he was a comic book fan, genre fan, and he had gone through the original black and white comics and he had pieced together his concept of the movie was, you know, uh, Turtles movie one and parts of Leonardo and issues 10 and 11. He said, the movie's here and we'll, we'll build it from there. And uh, a lot of respect. Um, then he brought in this fantastic writer, uh, Todd Langdon, who had come out of um, you know, the family dramedy of the Wonder Years. And that's really everything that encompassed all things Turtles was this family, you know, this adoptive family kind of thing. So Todd wrote this great script based on some of the original comics um, and influenced by the cartoon show. And then we got Jim Henson. That's like, yeah. you know, yeah, just and, uh, the king. his creature shot bringing him to life because if you don't have characters you can believe on the big screen, it, it just doesn't work. And, and uh, I still remember clearly the first time going down on set and seeing somebody in full costume and you can sort of like, they feel and they look real and it was, it was great. So um, fantastic. The first version of Casey Jones, the last Cateus, Judith Hogue is April. Just perfect storm. That was it was great. so good. Yeah. So, you know, recently a follow up to The Last Ronin was announced, which yeah. I love The Last Ronin, by the way. I'm going to geek out on you about how much I loved <laughs> The you. Last Ronin. So I was very excited <laughs> to hear about this and they're calling it The Lost Years. I don't know how much you can tell us about it, but it, I mean, is this going to be, I mean, is it a prequel to The Last Ronin or is it going to be like individual stories just sort of bouncing around timeline? Like, how's it going to work? Out? It's actually, it's both. It's a good question because it is, it was one of those things that we you know, adapting the story that Pete and I originally wrote in, in 87 and what Tom and I, you know, dug, dug down real deep and, and expanded that whole universe that became The Last Ronin. Um, and, and, and that was kind of it. We, we said, this is a story that's going to be here. And then as we worked more and more in The Last Ronin universe, we felt, man, there's a great story over here. We can tell a great story over here. We can tell. And we didn't want to leave it. So we came up with the epilogue in Last Ronin, which is the, the four new uh, baby turtles. Um, and so, all right, what do we do next? And we knew we wanted to do Last Run in Parts 2, at least Part 2, and we started working on the story of that, but we wanted to figure out some way to sort of ease into it. And one of the moments that we thought was the greatest out of the original to explore, one of the greatest ideas to explore out of the original Last Run in was um, in issue four when Michelangelo goes to Japan and finds out what happened to Splinter and Donatello, and he 
takes Splinter's journal, and as we say in the book, he just started walking. Well, it was 16 years from when he started walking in issue four to issue one when he came back to New York. Um, and so last, uh, the last years would be every three years over five issues, you see what happened to him on his journey before he ends up back in New York. At the same time, the issue will be you split of what's happening with the new turtles, you start at the end of issue five, is they're evolving into teenagers. So you get to see both universes at the same time. And that's what we're exploring so that uh, you really get to see the development of one while you see this great moments and what happened to um, where the scars came from and where the, the things came from. So it's a very exciting, um, and that's hands down my favorite part of working with Tom Waltz, um, who not only wrote 100 amazing issues of the Turtles and the ongoing series, that he is strictly story first. And so we, we spend the time and we sit there and we go through what makes a really interesting story for us it makes us excited, gets us excited about reading it, um, and then and that's that's the way forward. Well, recently we've seen this trend in Hollywood where there's this this rise of the legacy sequels, mm -hmm. right? So it's these twenty to thirty year later sequels, and then there's certain characters like Spider Man or Batman where now they're starting to forego origins altogether, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the audience has seen that, so we don't need to do it again. So with the Turtles, I feel like you can sort of do the same thing. So bringing it back to that nineteen ninety movie and Secret of the Ooze. Was there ever any thought that you could maybe uh, bring it back around to those movies with The Last Ronin and do like an updated sequel and sort of adapt that to live action? Well, it's, it's really intriguing because, um, you know, when you see, um, like we, you know, the first Turtle movie being, you know, hands down the favorite movie for all the reasons that it was, being the perfect storm that what needed to be lined up and to create that movie with The Last Ronin is similar to that, um, Peter and I wrote that story in 87. That's the same year that we started developing the toys and the cartoons. So this idea got pushed back, you know, 10 years, then 20 years, and we never did it. So the first time we looked at seriously uh, adapting this story was 2018, which 30 years in the future from 87. So it was already a year past when we had set it when Peter and I originally wrote it. Um, and so to it was just the right time. We'd finished 100 issues. We had this great foundation of this new IDW universe, but we wanted this to be a standalone that looked back to the original Mirage series. And so it's almost foregoing the Turtle cartoon universe and you know, with the Archer universe and, and all other, the IDW universe, which I love, the Nickelodeon universes, and going back to issue one was the beginning, last run in is the end of that original saga. Um, so there's been People, uh, you know, Nickelodeon owns the Turtles, and they've talked a couple times about how to adapt it um, and the best way to adapt it. So we're, we're sort of wait and see to see how those cards line up because yeah. it's got to be perfect as I'm well. I'm sure so. I'm not the only one that's had that idea, <laughs> but I think it's a perfect idea. I think Thanks. we should do it. I think uh, we should do it. I'd love to see. I, you know, what I immediately thought of is uh, when they finally, when Warner Brothers adapted Frank Miller's um, Dark Knight and they did his animated, but they really followed his script and followed his designs, and, and I felt if... Last run and you were doing it in his live action, it would probably be like this crazy budget buster kind of thing. So, you know, but um, so I thought animation might be a way to approach it. But, you know, again, Absolutely. we'll see. Well, this was such a pleasure <laughs> for me, Kevin. Thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time to talk with me. My pleasure. And thank you guys for watching. Make sure you keep it locked on comicbook.com for all the rest of your New York Comic Con coverage. <laughs>